Hi, uh, welcome. This is Jewish Genealogy Research, and my name is Elaine Hayes. I'm coming to you from the Laramie County Library in Cheyenne, Wyoming, and I'm going to go ahead and share my PowerPoint right now with you and get started. Okay, um, as I said, I'm Elaine Hayes. I work at the Laramie County Library in Cheyenne, Wyoming. And um, I've been teaching genealogy classes for about 16 years now. Um, I've been teaching this particular class for about 10 years, I believe. Um, and um, uh, just updated it for 2021. Um, I, uh, if you have any questions, uh, you can reach me by email which is ehays at lclsonline.org. And uh, I also have some handouts for this class that, that I'd be pleased to send you if you send me an email. Um, how do you start researching your genealogy? It's the same for everyone. Um, you record what you already know about your family. Um, Talk to your relatives and find out what they know about the family. Um, you want to get not only names and dates and places, but you want to get those family stories too, because all of that are clues that'll help you. You want to start with yourself, kind of work backwards in time. So uh, when you're recording your information, you want to collect vital records and vital records are things like birth, marriage, and death records, whether they be um, official government vital records or birth certificates and such, or um, religious records, anything that would tell you about birth, marriage, and death. Um, a good way to start in the United States is to start with the 1940 federal, US federal census. And we will be doing that when I show you some examples. Um, and by the way, this, this um, class is, is focused on um, American genealogy. So American Jewish genealogy and with an emphasis on Ashkenazi Jewish genealogy. We will talk about uh, Sephardic genealogy also, but, but not as much. <laughs> Uh, keep a record of every search and what you find. So you're going to start accumulating a lot of papers or files on your computer and things like that. So, um, but uh, there are different ways to deal with, with, your, with all those files, like uh, using file cabinets or using a genealogy computer program, which is probably what most people do these days. So how do you keep track of all this information? Use paper forms and notebooks or filing cabinets. Um, a, a, a piece of genealogy software that lives just on your computer or uh, storing your information, your family trees and family information on a private or shared uh, online database such as ancestry.com or familysearch.org. And most of the genealogists I know actually do a little bit of all three of these things. Um, Cause you do want a backup of your information if it's lost in one form, you have it in another form is, is always a good idea. There's a lot of places that you can find free paper forms, including at the Laramie County Library, but also, which is the second thing on this list, but also uh, websites like Cindy's List, um, Family Tree Magazines, free, uh, genealogy forms, and um, you could also, if you're gonna save it on genealogy software, the kind that live on your computer, you can legacy family tree, family tree bu bu builder, Roots Magic Essentials all have free software that you can get. Um, their standard editions are usually free, but a lot of times they don't quite have as much bells and whistles that, that you like. So, um, you know, you can start with the free version and upgrade to a, to a better version that's going to cost you. And they usually cost around $25, $30, up to $50 for, 
for these, these uh, databases. And they usually come with free updates. When they update the software, they will send you a free update. Oh, uh, by the way, all of these websites that I mentioned are in the handout. So, um, you know, email me if you'd like to hand out. Uh, start searching in the US federal census, um, starting with that 1940 census, which is the newest one that is available for genealogists to search and then work backwards in time. In the United States, we are lucky that a, a census has been taken in the US every 10 years without fail from 1790 to 2020. Um, the uh, 1950 census, by the way, will be available in April of 2022, which is coming up real soon. But at this point, which is September of 2021, uh, the, the the census that's available is the 1940 census. Um, census images for all those years of census are available at places like Ancestry Library, Ancestry.com, HeritageQuest, and other databases such as FamilySearch.org. And we will talk about all of these databases a, a little bit more length. Um, just to touch on this, Ancestry.com is a, a paid database that you can buy a subscription at home, but uh, Ancestry Library Edition is the library version of Ancestry.com, and that is available through your public library. Um, our library here at, at Cheyenne, in Cheyenne, Wyoming, um, you can search it at home until December 2021 because of COVID. Um, I don't know if they'll expand that. We'll see. It, um, they did that because originally because a lot of libraries, public libraries were closed and people couldn't come in to search. So they allowed you access at home. But you would have to go through your library's website, put in library card number and pin information and things like that to access that. Um, call the library if you have more questions. Heritage Quest is also a database that you can access through your library. And familysearch.org is a free database. You do have to sign up and register, but it's through the LDS or the Mormon Church. Um, and uh, they have the largest genealogy library in the uh, world. And they have information from all over the world, all religions, don't have to be Mormon, um, to, to, to find. Um, and that's, that's a great database for you to start searching at home. Um, I'm going to show you how to find our databases on our website, which is lclsonline.org. That, that LCLS stands for Laramie County Library System, online.org. Um, and then when you get here, it looks something like this. Click on the library catalog. I have it circled in red there. Um, when you click on the library catalog, it'll look like this. And this is the, the uh, page where you would just, you know, if you want to find a book by title or author, you would enter that here. Um, but you can, and, and you could also search what books we have in our genealogy room here at the library too. You would change where it says Cheyenne over on the left-hand side to uh, Cheyenne genealogy and, and then search by title, author, subject, whatever. Um, but we're going to go look at our databases right now. So click on that, um, that tab that says databases in the middle there, kind of middle to the right. Um, when you go there, you will get to this page. And I would also like to point out that if, if it, you find this easier, you can go there directly by going to go wild, G-O-W-Y-L-D dot net. And um, and that's, that's the State Library's website because um, most of the databases in that you have access to in Wyoming are statewide, uh, paid for by money from the Wyoming State Legislature. And so they're um, kind of administered by the State Library, but you can go directly to gowild.net to get here too. Uh, you'll see a subject list because there's hundreds of databases of all sorts of subjects but we do have some databases about genealogy and you'll see the subject in alphabetical order down here uh, is genealogy at the bottom. 
These are the databases, the genealogy recommended databases, in addition to Ancestry Library. And it says here, you know, we have home use until December 31st, 2021. There's also Heritage Quest, News Vault, African American Heritage, ProQuest newspapers, Sanborn Maps, and Wyoming newspapers. So all of those databases are also helpful for genealogy. And I've circled the two, the two big ones, Ancestry Library uh, and Heritage Quest. Heritage Quest is a, a kind of a, owned by ProQuest. Um, it has the same information as Ancestry Library, but it's a subset of Ancestry Library. Uh, um, but it has things like the census, all of the census information that you can search. Um, and my heritage database, we just saw it. It's, you can also search it through our catalog, lclsonline.org. Um, when you get to the point that you want to, this point, <laughs> that you want to search Ancestry or our, our Heritage Quest and do a search on it and you click on that, it is going to ask for your library card number and PIN. And the second part of this page tells you that you need to put in your number, no letters, no spaces, just the number part and the PIN. And the default pins that we gave out at Laramie County Library were wild. We did that for, oh, 15 years at least. W-Y-L-D as the default. But the last five years maybe about, we have the default has been read, R-E-A-D. So I usually tell people to try those depending on how old their card is. And if neither one of them work, call the library and we can let you know what your pin is. So as I mentioned before, the Ancestry Library is just the library version of Ancestry.com. It's exactly the same, exactly the same information you can search. The, the difference is that when you buy a subscription that you have at home, there's a lot of personalization to it. You can enter your own family information, family trees, and it will do some automatic searching for you and give you hints. Uh, it can't do that with a shared database. You're going to have to go in and do the searches yourself, but it's the same information and available until actually December 31st, not 30th, December 31st, 2021, because of COVID. All right, so this is Jewish genealogy. What's different about Jewish genealogy? Why have a separate class for Jewish genealogy? Well, there um, were a little bit later adoption of hereditary surnames for um, Jews than, than many other cultures. Uh, in, in fact, until um, most Jews didn't have surnames before 1800. So, so 19th century is kind of late. Um, most cultures, they were adopted before then, except for maybe Scandinavian. Some of the Scandinavians hung on to, um, to non-hereditary sur surnames a bit longer too. Um, Jewish culture and religion can influence genealogy such as in naming patterns, um, naming uh, a, a, a new child after a deceased ancestor, for, for example, or a naming pattern that maybe names first son after father's father or something like that. And I will talk about this more later. The Holocaust, of course. Um, nearly all Jewish American families have relatives that were killed in the Holocaust. Um, so often, um, until they start doing genealogy, they don't realize this because these are family members usually that stayed behind in Europe when their uh, direct ancestors um, immigrated. So they may have lost con contact with that part of the family, but um, once you start doing genealogy, you, you usually will find someone that was killed in the Holocaust. There are some specific Jewish genealogy sources, and this is what mostly what this class is all about, is to tell you about those kind of specific sources. And this list came from Gary Makatov of avatanyu.com which is a Jewish genealogy website and, and a place that sells a lot of great Jewish genealogy books. And I will mention them 
again later too. Um, Jewish, Jewish genealogy is an immigrant genealogy and almost all of the ancestors of Jewish Americans arrived in the US re fairly recently in the past 150 years. So therefore you probably, after you go back a few generations, you will find that you need, need to do some international research. Um, and, and therefore you maybe find yourself communicating with distant relatives all over the world in Europe, um, in um, maybe the Middle East, maybe, maybe in Israel. Um, and um, one thing to point out is that the reasons why people immigrate um, are the same for everybody. Um, I usually talk about push factors and pull factors. Uh, push factors are the bad things that push you out of, a, of the country, of your country of origin. And it could be things like war, discrimination, pogroms, famine, things like that. Um, or just because of discrimination, lack of any kind of financial or educational opportunities, things like that. Those could be pushing you out. Pull factors are things that are pulling you to another country. And those are things that are, are specific about that, the country you're immigrating to. Things could be things like freedom, but it also very well could be things like uh, that other family members are already there, uh, free land. The um, Homestead Act actually brought a lot of people from Europe to the United States because they were offering free land, which is amazing to anybody in Europe where the land is already owned by somebody. All the land is owned by someone and um, that you can come and get free land um, even if you just immigrated. <clears throat> Uh, this kind of sort of is um, a summary of Jewish immigrant arrivals to the U.S. early on and even up to 1838. There were not a lot. There were some um, Jews immigrating to the U.S. all along, but less than 15,000 up to 1838. Uh, from 1838 to 1880, it, it picks up quite a bit, and a lot of these came from um, Jew, uh, sorry, German places like um, uh, the Austro-Hungary Empire, uh, German-speaking Europe. From um, 1881 to 1923, you see more Eastern Europeans. You see more from Poland and Lithuania and Russia and uh, places like that. And that's this is the big um, era of, of European immigration of Jews is the 1880s to 1920s. And there's about 2 million that immigrated at that time. It drops off severely exactly in 1924 because there was something, an act passed called the John, Johnson Reed Immigration Act. And we'll talk about that a little bit more in the next slide but it provided quotas. Um, it, it basically said that there were, people could only come from certain parts of the world and it was um, cut down Jewish immigration a lot. Um, after the 1940s to 1963, there were Holocaust survivors that, that immigrated. Many, many immigrated, um, not only to the United States, but to, to Canada to uh, other places in, in Europe and uh, Israel also. Uh, after 1964, uh, Russian Jews, especially during the Soviet era and others, um, and it decreased, well, it's, it's stayed about steady at about 50,000 a year. So, um, and this is more about the Johnson Reed Act of 1924. It limits the number of immigrants allowed into the United States through a national origins quota. And the quota provided immigration visas to 2% of the total number of people um, of each nationality in the United States as of the 1890 census. 
um, and it completely excluded immigrants from Asia and it cut Jewish immigration by 90%. So um, this was very much a, um, a, a racist ethnocentric um, kind of law. It had a lot to do with the eugenics movement. Um, and it's interesting that this is 1924 and they're using the 1890 census. They did have the 1900, 1910 and 1920 censuses but they were like <laughs> trying to make America great again, you know, by going back to the way it was in 1890 um, in their mind. Um, this is actually really interesting because it, it, it cut out a lot of uh, immigration, like made it almost impossible for people to immigrate from Asia, from Africa, from Eastern Europe, anywhere in Eastern Europe. Um, so, um, it had, it had a lot to do with the way the immigrants coming to, to um, the US. It, it favored Western and Northern European immigrants. Um, two US representatives, Albert Johnson and, um, and Senator David Reed uh, were the two main architects of the act. Um, they had a lot of, congressional support. There were a lot of people also agreeing with them. There were only nine dissenting votes in the Senate and just a handful in the House of Representatives. Um, the most vigorous opponent was freshman Brooklyn representative Emanuel Seller, who was a Jewish American. Um, decades later, he pointed out the acts startling discrimination against Central, Eastern, and Southern Europe. So fortunately, the act was revised in 1952 and, and replaced in 1965 with a no quota system. That's why um, immigration did pick up again in the 60s because um, they got rid of that quota system. Okay, one place to look at is Ellis Island because it was open during the, the time of the big Jewish immigration waves. Um, and it was open, only open from 1892 to 1957. And that, that time period um, might fall after, you know, your ancestors came. Um, people, it only covers um, New York immigration and people could immigrate any way they wanted to. They could immigrate in any port that was open. So they could have immigrated through Boston or Philadelphia or New Orleans or San Francisco or any other place too, um, or through Canada. Many did, many came in through Canada and then a bit, you know, just crossed the border you know, in a car or later. Um, the website for Ellis Island is libertyellisislandfoundation.org and then slash passenger for your passenger search. Their database searches 1892 to 1957. You must, you need to sign in. It's like the Family Search website. You, it's free, but you need to sign in to do searches. Um, their searches are a little funky and they're always trying to sell you stuff. So it's good to, to point out that um, Stephen Morse, One Step Search website, will also search all the, the free stuff at Ellis Island. It will usually do a search for you. And then for you to actually look at it, you still have to sign in because it's a, he's, just, he's just doing the search, helping you with the search at their website. But stevemorris.org is a good place to look too. Um, and I would also say, if you're looking for your, your Jewish ancestors, they're gonna mo be mostly pre-1924 because of the reasons I already told you about, about the, the act that was passed. Uh, this is what the, the search form looks like. And, you know, you just enter first name, uh, last name, and it'll give you a list of results. And um, these it, it give you a lot of great information if you, if you find your ancestors in here. Uh, also important to realize that the Ellis Island um, passenger search information is available at Ancestry.com. Uh, and I think 
it might be searched at Family Search too. So used to be you had to go to this website to find this information, um, but you can also still, you can find it in um, the genealogy databases too. Uh, more in immigration databases, Castle Garden. This is New York immigration before Ellis Island opened in 1892. Um, the reason why Ellis Island opened is 1892. We had more immigration laws. Um, they weren't doing quotas, but they were doing um, asking people a lot of questions. They wanted to make sure that you weren't going, if you immigrated, you weren't trying to escape a bad past or leaving your family behind, you know, that, that, um, that you could support yourself, that you weren't handicapped, that you weren't uh, sick, <laughs> things like that, or that you might be sent back. But before then, um, Castle Garden has some immigration information. Before 1892, generally, if you got on a ship and paid your passage, and, and intended to immigrate, you could immigrate. You came in and uh, the United States would let you in. You didn't have to have a visa, you just came. Um, but after 1892, more laws. The Immigrant Ship Transcribers Guild uh, is, uh, has a lot of non-New York City immigrant immigration information and it's immigrantships.net. And once again, just to remind you, um, these websites are in my handouts. So uh, email me if you'd like a handout. Um, U.S. National Archives is uh, at archives.gov has some immigration information. The U.S. Uh, National Archives is the original holder of any federal information and immigration information is federal information. So um, that's a good place to look. And uh, if you're looking for post-1957 immigration information, not at the Ellis Island website, um, you may need to go to the US Citizenship and Immigration Service. Um, those, uh, that information is probably more likely to be under privacy laws and restricted to just um, next of kin. Um, so, but, but they can help you out with that. Most of the information that they're going to give you at USCIS.gov is going to be information they're going to pay for. So keep in mind that. <laughs> and um, I wouldn't go to a government agency like that until I had basically all your ducks in a row. You know, you've got all the information that you can find and you just need that little and last document that you can't find. Um, as I mentioned before, uh, before 1800, uh, few Jews had hereditary surnames. Um, so it's a little bit more, more difficult to trace patronomic names such as Isaac Ben Abraham or Isaac Bat, uh, or I'm sorry, or Miriam Bat Abraham. So a man or a woman, Ben or Bat. Um, and Ben means Ben or Bat means son of or daughter of Abraham, which gives you, it, 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 um, and you will still see these as uh, the Hebrew name like written on his headstone, even if the person has another name also. And you'll also see it in um, Israel these days. Uh, a little bit more about surnames um, and this kind of, Anybody's surname is usually either an occupation, a place. It could be a patronymic uh, telling you, you know, son of somebody. Uh, sometimes there are chosen names that are just kind of nice or they um, describe physical characteristics. In this case, we have occupations like Kramer or Kaufman, which means merchant, um, Metzger, Resnick or Stechter, Butcher, Schuster, Schneider, you know, shoemaker, tailor, uh, leader means leather, so a leather worker. Um, place names, often with a ski or an ER at the end. Unger is from Hungary, Warshawski from Warsaw. Um, physical characteristics, and 
you will sometimes get um, translations from German or uh, Hebrew. Uh, Schwartz is black, Braun, brown, gross, big, Klein, little, Geller, um, yellow, or in Yiddish, redhead. Um, most of those are German translations. Um, patronymics, Mendelssohn, which is son of Mendel. Uh, pretty names, these are usually chosen names when the government came along and said that you needed to choose a name. You, you know, weren't already kind of been known as a, a physical characteristic like black or little or whatever. Um, but so you chose a, a nice sounding name like Rosenberg, Goldstein, Hirsch, which means deer, um, things like that. <coughs> Um, also, of course, there's the, um, the priestly caste members, so Kohanim names, um, descend, and, and basically these names may go back farther than the 19th century too. Um, descendants of Aaron, high priest caste, the Kohanim, Cohen, Kagan, Kogan, Khan, Khan, Katz, Kaplan, Rappaport are, are usually Kohanim. Uh, Levim, descendants of Levi, keeper of the, ten, the temple, names such as Levi, Levin, Siegel, Landau, Horowitz, and Epstein. Um, Israel, Israelites is all other Jewish people, but I have seen the last name of Israel too. <clears throat> uh, given names or first names um, for Ashkenazi Jews, um, traditionally you would um, name their children after deceased relatives. Um, it was not common practice to name up after someone who was still living. Um, often would be the recently deceased, and and, and mostly that's um, you know for practical reasons. Nobody could name their child after grandma while she was alive, but she just passed away, and you have a little girl, so. Um, you know, you can, you can now name them after your deceased relatives to honor them. Um, Sephardic Jews, um, these are Jews descended from medieval Spain um, area, um, Iberian Peninsula, Spain, Portugal, and sometimes Northern um, Africa. First son, father's father, first daughter, mother's mother, second son, mother's father, second daughter, father's mother, things like that. This is, is a common pattern. Jewish cemetery research is also a little bit different and also kind of cool. Um, there are symbols and, and Hebrew writing, which can be really helpful in um, your genealogy. Um, most uh, old Jewish cemeteries in Europe do still exist. Um, the headstones are often in Hebrew or Yiddish. Um, so all you need is someone that can help you translate it. Uh, parents' names are often on headstones and thus can take you back another generation. Uh, very, very often. They're, that's what the, the Hebrew will tell you what the person's fa father's name and sometimes the mother's name. And that gets you, like, it's, like I just said, back another generation. Um, the symbols on the tombstones uh, can also... Um, give you information like the first one there, the two hands with thumbs touching is a priestly blessing for the Kohanim families. Okay, and I was going to say the uh, the picture is uh, a Levite symbol, so so um, Levite families of a picture in reference to the traditional duty to wash the hands of the temple priest. And the other two, of course, is the Star of David. And uh, um, so just, just general symbols of, of Jewish descent. This website, Jewish Gen, is very, I, I will show you a lot about Jewish Gen. That is probably my number one recommended Jewish genealogy website. Definitely, you have to go to Jewish Gen, log in, create an account. Uh, you can find a lot of stuff without logging in, but you'll, you'll do better. You can even become a member, but you can have a free account too. 
uh, gives you information like how to read a, a Hebrew tombstone, um, how to interpret what's the Jewish calendar if you run into um, num uh, years from the Jewish calendar, what is that in our, our years, um, things like that. So these Jewish temples, tombstones with Hebrew inscriptions have an added value to genealogists. Um, not only do they show you the date of death and sometimes the age or, or date of birth, but they also include the, the name of the given name of the deceased father, things like that. Uh, this is another place, the Complete Visual Guide to Jewish Headstones, which is at cousinist.com at this website. Another thing you can do is just, you know, of course, Google that, um, interpreting Jewish headstones or something like that and find some of these websites. Um, the um, sad topic of the Holocaust or Shoah, 50% of European Jews and 91% of Polish Jews were murdered in the Holocaust. Most of these victims, unfortunately, have no known gravesite, and the destruction of pre-World War II European Jewish artifacts was nearly total. Many Jews believe that documenting and researching each person's fate can function as a memorial to lost relatives. So um, places like Yad Vashem in uh, Jerusalem have trying to find, uh, put a name to every, every face and every picture find out what happened to everyone as much as they can. And so um, you can add to that by uh, searching Holocaust ancestors. If you're doing some, some Holocaust research, these are some great places to look. Um, the Shoah Victims Names Database in, at Yad Vashem, the International Tracing Service, um, which found out um, especially right after World War II, what happened to people and where they went when because family was families were separated. Uh, Yesor books at Jewish gene, genealogy, JewishGen, I'm sorry, dot, dot org, Holocaust Survivors and Victims Resource Center, um, and footnote.com, which uh, has a Holocaust collection. And footnote.com is another thing that you can. Um, another paid genealogy database that you can sub subscribe to. You can actually get this as a sort of a package deal with Ancestry.com. You know, if you pay a little more, you can get footnote. And I think newspapers.com is another one that can come with um, uh, Ancestry.com. Oh, and I was going to say, you know, if I pronounce things wrong, my apologies, I'm doing the best I can without um, actually having Jewish ancestry myself. Um, here are some more Jewish genealogy websites, um, jewishgen.org, Avotanu, the Jewish Genealogical Society. These are places you can go to find how to do Jewish genealogy research. You know, some more, some of them have actual databases that you can search. Um, there are, or you can belong to a, a genealogy society, sort of an interest group and have some research partners that might help you with your, your search. Um, answer questions, things like that. Uh, Sephardic Gen, Sephardim.com, um, Jewish Web Index. These were all useful databases that I found. Okay, um, now we're gonna get started and um, it'll, it'll take a, probably about an hour and a half, hour and 15 minutes to hour and a half to finish. And we've already been doing this about 40 minutes. So, um, but we're gonna do some searching in ancestry.com now. And then when you go to ancestry library edition, it looks like this. This is actually the library edition search page and you can click on begin searching. Um, you can, um, there are different ways to search. You can just like start, start searching with census and things like that. Um, it says receive records at home, send, doc, send document. That is emailing, but it's probably, 
easier, I think, to just have a flash drive or save it on your computer or something. If you come to the library, bring a flash drive with you. You can print things too, but I think it's just easier. Okay, this is the first search page, looks like that. You can put in, you know, first and middle names, last name, a place, any place that you know they lived. And you can start, I would, I usually tell people to start with someone that you know was alive in the 1940 census. This could be a parent or a grandparent or even a great grandparent, but someone that you probably know pretty well or you know their birth and death date, where they live, things like that. Um, start searching them. If they, you know that they were alive in 1940. Um, any place they lived, you know, you could start with, if you know they, where they lived in 1940, start with that. Um, there's also show more options by that orange search. And that opens up things that you can add um, a spouse's name, a child's name, uh, and, you know, a birth or death date additional information that you might happen to know about that person. That's really helpful if you've got somebody with a common common name. Okay, I just am showing you here what's available in the card catalog, just searching Jewish, the word Jewish. There's actually 96 databases about uh, with um, inf Jewish information. You know, there's a given name variation, the Shoah Foundation, um, there's Poland, East, Eastern Europe information, Uzbekistan, Hungary, uh, Boston Jewish Advocate Wedding Announcements, that's a Jewish newspaper. So there's all sorts of things. And the records, it does list the records. That top one looks like has 723,000 records. So probably 723,000 names. This is uh, the Jewish community locator. This is on Ancestry, but it's actually from um, Jewish Gen. Uh, so there's probably, that's probably available in both places at Jewish Gen and also at Ancestry. So you can enter uh, the name of a place. And um, if you know latitude or longitude or where it was located, uh, any kind of a keyword, population in 1900. You'll notice there's name in 1900, name in 1930, name in 1950. Well, yes, the names, the place names changed because borders changed and it might be in um, Russian in 1900. Um, the name might be a Russian name, might be a Polish name in 1930, might be a German name in or a Lithuanian name or something in 1950. So you never know, depending on where it is. This is my example, um, Morris Widlansky. And I know that, that his wife's name is Rachel. And that's pretty much all I know to start, except that I'm pretty sure that, that I can find them in um, the census. This was actually a former co-workers, great-grandparents that I was searching for. And I found 90 records under Morris Widlansky with a wife named Rachel. So we're doing pretty well. Not all of them are going to be the right person, but um, we found some good stuff. Usually it will start with the most likely, you know, the, the best hits on top, most relevant. So we have a find a grave um, at, with a Morris Widlansky born in March, 1863 and died in 1934. Uh, we have a 1910 census, have Morris uh, born eight, about 1865 in Russia, arrived, so they're asking about immigration in 1882, and in 1910, they are living in Atlantic City, New Jersey. We have a social, secure, social security application for Morris Widlansky to look at and a 1920 census. And you'll notice Widlansky spelled different. Spelling doesn't count in genealogy because uh, everybody's name changed spelling. Every, every family 
you'll find multiple spellings of their names, which came in multiple different ways. They could have spelled it different. Uh, the census taker spelled it different. The, um, the person that indexed the record uh, in, uh, misread it. There's all, all sorts of ways that, that the spelling can be different. So I know, don't worry too much. The spelling's a little different. Okay, this first one was Morris Woodlansky's US Find a Grave uh, information. And this one was really helpful because what we have is we have an image of the headstone with Hebrew writing on it that we can translate. But we have Morris Woodlansky, birth uh, March 1863, death date 1935. We have him in Radef Shalom Cemetery and a, a Jewish cemetery in Atlantic City, New Jersey, spouse Rachel, children Samuel. And if we already knew Samuel is correct, that's a pretty good hint. And you might look below to the right for the suggested records. I always pay attention to those because those are really good. So um, we have 1920, 1910, 1900 census, 1930 census that we'd all like to, to look at in, in addition to city directory and the social security death index. This is more. There's an up close picture and there's a picture of below both Rachel and um, Morris are on in the same grave. So they, they, they're on the same headstone. And actually Samuel has, um, there's a link to him. Um, so you can go right to his um, grave also. This is the 1930 federal census, which was one of those suggested records. In this case, we look through here. In 1930, um, we have an estimated birth year. So we probably asked in census, we'll look at it, but they're probably asking how old you are now, rather than what's your birthday. Um, he's male, he's white, he's 66 years old. He says, says on this one, he's born in Lithuania. Um, marital status is married. He's the head of the household. We have a street address. He lives on Winchester Street um, with house number is 4014 Winchester Street, as a matter of fact. Um, below uh, the age at first marriage is 23. So you can kind of look back and figure out when, what year were they married. And he also asks, uh, he can read and write. Um, his father's birthplace is in Lithuania. So a lot of good information to, to look at here. And there's more. <laughs> here below, we have Rachel too, because we have the head of the household and his wife. No kids, because they're 66 and 65. Kids are grown up and they've got their own home, right? But we're starting from the most recent and going backward in time. Here we got suggested records again. Like I said, always keep track of those, pay attention, and make sure you, you go back to these. All right, so I have, um, I circled where they are and we have um, um, Morris Woodlansky. And it's good to, to know how the census taker took the information. They would go down the street from one house to the next house, or if they were in an apartment building from one apartment to the next. So the people on this page and the page before, page after, because you can page through these and look before and after, these are neighbors. These are neighbors on the same street, as a matter of fact. They write the street name over on the left. Um, in this case, I circled um, Morris Woodlansky and Rachel, but I also circled Lewis Abraham, and his, um, and Mildred and Alan. Uh, Lewis Abraham's daughter, Mildred and grandson, Alan. And part of the reason why is because um, they are in the same house number. If you look under there, they're all at 414 Winchester Street. So I think we have three generations of one family living in this household. 
So they have, I would guess they have a daughter named Mildred who married Louis Abrahams. And um, also their uh, son, Alan, is also living with them. If you look over here, you'll notice we have male, they, they ask, answer the question, male or female, uh, race, these are, everybody on the page is W for white, uh, age, um, married or single, and their age at first marriage, and um, whether they attended school in the last nine months or something, and actually nobody, because everybody's either an adult <laughs> and no longer going to school or they're, they're too young. In fact, uh, Alan, the son is two, like two and a half years old. I can't really read that, but looks like he's, 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 he's a little boy. Um, birthplace is listed for each person. Um, Morris and Rachel says Lithuania. Uh, Lewis, Mildred, and son. Um, Mildred, who I think is the daughter, she was born in New Jersey, and so was the son. Um, Lewis was born in New York. Uh, you also answered the question, where was your father born, and where was your mother born? Um, Morris and Rachel both say Lithuania for both mother and father. Lewis has Poland and England. Uh, Mildred has Lithuania for both her, her parents, which is correct. They say that they were born in Lithuania. And Alan, well, his father was born in New York. And mother born in New Jersey. Uh, over to the side, they do ask what language is spoken in the home. And it says Yiddish for both uh, Morris and Rachel. And if you look above some of their... Um, uh, neighbors uh, speak Polish. If you look a little bit farther down, we have um, occupation for everybody. Um, Morris Woodlansky is retired, but um, um, Lewis is a merchant. There are a builder, a butcher, um, trying to see him, other people in a printer, somebody works in a restaurant. So other people, other occupations. Uh, industry, I see real estate, musical. Oh, there's a director and a musician. Um, I was trying to say, oh, he's a merchant in a retail. So, so we're, we're finding information. If that's your family, that's all pretty interesting information. Oh. Very important, I skipped immigration year, which comes um, right between where it says they speak Yiddish and um, their occupation. Um, we have a year of immigration and it says NA, which means they're naturalized. I think it says 1896, maybe, as a year of immigration for the Woodlanskys. Okay, so we're going back in time. So um, this is the 1920 federal census. We had 1930, now there's 1920. They didn't show up in 1940 because, well, we already saw that um, Morris died in 1934. So he wasn't at least in the um, 1940 census. I probably need to look for Rachel there because she was, she was still alive. But this is the 1920 census. Um, now, instead of Lithuania, it says his birthplace is, was Russia. He's 10 years younger because this is 10 years before. Uh, they're in uh, on North Arkansas Avenue, house number 131. So they're, they're living somewhere else. We have spouse of Rachel. Uh, she says her father's birthplace was Poland and her mother's birthplace was Poland. Before she said Lithuania, so um, I think it's the same place and same information. It's just that the the um, there the, right now in 1920, it's probably Poland. Um, 1930, it was Lithuania. So I think the 
the borders are changing. Oh, by the way, he says below his occupation is a chauffeur in the industry is taxi cab. So he's a taxi driver. He's a 1920 taxi cab driver in uh, Atlantic, Atlantic City, New Jersey. Down below, um, he's, he's self-employed driving that taxi. Uh, their home is mortgaged. They're naturalized. Uh, their immigration year is listed as 1884. And that could have been what it said before and I just couldn't read it. Um, Morris down below, the household members all listed. We have Morris, Rachel, Samuel. Remember he came up on Find a Glaive, Gertrude and Mildred. Mildred was on that census, wasn't she? 10 years later as a, as a married woman with a child. More suggestive records here too, including New Jersey state censuses um, and World War I draft registration cards and Pennsylvania marriages, all sorts of good things there. Um, Pennsylvania marriage, it's not gonna be Morris and Rachel getting married. It's going to be them as parents to their, one of their sons or daughters getting married. Okay, this is what the 1920 census looks like, um, the scanned in image. It's a little bit harder to read than the previous one that we looked at. But there's Morris, Woodlansky, Rachel, Samuel. Um, is it Gertrude and Mildred? Yeah, Gertrude and Mildred, sorry. Um, and uh, we have a male or female, white, their age, married or single, uh, 1884 is a naturalization time, uh, whether they can read, write, and speak English, um, and everybody's yes. Um, attended school is the other question, and only the kids are yes to that. Their birthplace, um, Interesting here because they first write Vilna, V-I-L-N-A, and then mark that out and put Russia. Vilna is the place, the city. So that's really a really nice clue. Um, and we have tongue is Polish. It was just interesting because then 10 years later, they say they're speaking Yiddish. So I don't know if they maybe were speaking Polish and Yiddish or, um, or maybe the census taker didn't know what they were speaking. Uh, let's see. He's a chauffeur. Um, son is, who is 28, is a salesman. This is looking up a little bit closer to the where, where we have immigration information. Um, and we also have naturalization information. And where it says Vilna and it's marked out. They were supposed to write just the country or state of someone's birth, not um, a, a city or an area. So that's why it's marked out. But most of the time, the census takers knew this might be helpful information maybe in the future, and they, they mark it out, but you can still read it, which is the case here. Um, 1910, since we're going back every 10 years uh, and following this family with the 1910 census, uh, they're in still in Atlantic City. Um, we have, um, he's a livery man, uh, livery man uh, driving hacks. So he might've actually had a taxi cab, 10 years later in 1920, but in 1910, he's probably driving um, a horse, <laughs> a, a horse-drawn cab um, in 1910. So he's, um, they're naturalized. Oh, we have more kids because 10 years later, we have some of our kids have grown up and they've moved out of the house. But now we have Rachel, we have a Julia Samuel, uh, Derry, Isidore, Gertrude, and Mildred. Um, Derry comes up 
and as Dory, all, all sorts of names. But this time it said Dairy. And this is a little bit hard to read. But there's, there's the same kids. This is the same people. You'll notice we're, we have R-U-S-S -S Yiddish as mother's birthplace. Hmm. So I think it's saying Russia, but they speak Yiddish. Um, Russian Yiddish. We have a uh, birthplace for the kids in New Jersey. Back to 1900, going a little bit faster. Still in New Jersey, they're in a different place on Goodwill Avenue, house number 51. <clears throat> Um, Morris is only 36 because we're going, he's getting 10 years younger every, every time we look at a, an earlier census. Uh, we have Gussie, it's a daughter that didn't show up earlier, uh, Julia, um, Samuel, and then Dory, Dora, not Derry or Dory, but Dara, Dora, and Jesse, it looks like. It's another son, which he didn't show up before. He may have passed away before that next census. I don't think he was there before. But if we look up ahead, we have Rachel spelled strangely, R-A-L-H-S-E-D. Spelling doesn't count, as you know. We have a marriage year this time, 1887. Uh, we have father and mother's birthplace as Russia now. Um, their birthplace didn't change, but I think the borders changed. Uh, he's a peddler at this point, which was a common kind of maybe new Jewish immigrant sort of thing to be uh, a peddler or work in a store or something like that. Okay, here's the Woodlanskys. We have... Um, Morris, Rachel, and the oldest daughter, Gussie, on the first page. Um, it says that Gussie's at school. Uh, we do have our um, year of um, immigration and naturalization. He's, he's naturalized. Doesn't say so for um, Rachel. Uh, depending on when he was naturalized, Rachel may not have had to be naturalized. Uh, just the head of the household and the father was naturalized and then everybody else in the household, uh, wife and any younger children was all kind of automatically naturalized if the father was naturalized, depending on the rules at that time. Okay, and this is just looking a little bit farther over. Um, I think it looks like 1885 for his um, immigration date and 1887 for hers, which this is getting farther back in time. So it, they're re maybe remembering a little more accurately when it was they came to the United States. And he may have came a couple of years before her. That's a possibility that did happen is that the um, man may have came first and established himself, got a job, got a place to live. And then, then the um, woman and mother and, and kids come later. That, that happens sometimes. And we have uh, um, Samuel and Dora in 1900. On the next page, by the way. <laughs> um, just because they were at the bottom of the page, then, then oh, Julia, Samuel, and Dora on the next page. And interestingly enough, we have Julia born in Pennsylvania. I think she's her, their oldest. Uh, no, their oldest is Gussie. And Gussie was born in Pennsylvania. Julia was born in Pennsylvania and the rest of the kids in New Jersey. And this might be an indication that they maybe they immigrated through Philadelphia or they lived for a, a period of time in, in Pennsylvania. Um, actually, it's not very far from uh, Pennsylvania border to Atlantic City, New Jersey. So they didn't go very far. 
Oh, and Jesse there is down at the bottom. I'm sorry, I, I cut him off, but there's their son, Jesse, too. Okay, and this is just looking at, um, I made a, a family tree for the Widlanskis in my personal ancestry.com account, um, just because it's it's good to, to record information. And this is, if you were really re, re, um, researching this family, your family, you would need to record it somewhere. And um, so you can look at it. Uh, if you have an ancestry.com, you wanna get all those hints. So he's here with all the sources that I've added to him. Um, 1900, 1910, 1920, 1930 census, the city directories, the find a grave, there's the spouse and kids, you know, all of them that I've added with their dates of birth and death as I found them. This is what it looks like in Ancestry. We have um, Morris and Rachel, their kids. And if I found a spouse for the kid, I've added that too. And sometimes I found their grandkids too, because I just kept doing more searching. Um, I, um, in Ancestry was provided with names of Morris's parents and a sister. <laughs> and, um, Morris's grandparents too. So all the way up there to Reuben Widlansky and Gussie, and then Abraham, Abraham Widlansky. So the, that's all the information. Just to kind of review what we got here, 1900, 1910, and 1920 information. So um, 1900, it says they were born in 1865 in Russia, um, married in 1887 immigrated 1885, 1887. Um, 1910, they said 1865 and 1867. So we have some variation in dates uh, that they immigrated in 1882. 1920, they say 1864 and 1865. Um, they immigrated in 1884 and 1886. I don't know if they're just not remembering correctly or whatever, but they're still sort of in the same range. Um, they, uh, the mother tongue is Polish and the birthplace of Vilna. Um, they were, and in 1920, it says they're both naturalized in 1894. So 1930, we have 1864 and 1865 which at least is consistent with 1920. Now they're saying they were born in Lithuania and that they immigrated in 1886, but it's also longer away. But maybe, maybe their English is better and the census taker could understand them, who knows. But, but there's some variations but in what information you're gonna find in different census. Part of this variation with like place of birth, maybe because of the changes in the map, <laughs> political changes. Uh, many people don't know anything about where their family came from, except it says Russia or, or you know, the family's um, legend is Russia or Germany or Austria or something like that. Until the end of World War I, these were the three countries, Russia, Germany, Austria, three countries that made up most of Central and Eastern Europe. So that sort of information is really helpful. So if you look at Germany, Austria, Hungary, and Russia, that's a big chunk of the map. Um, if you're able to find the town of origin of immigration, uh, it's really helpful. Uh, and you may be able to find it somewhere, either in immigration records or, you know, a nice little clue like Vilna in, in uh, the census. Um, the spelling should be correct in passenger arrival records um, for the, the town, or at least how it was spelled at that time. Uh, 1930, Europe looks a little bit different if they immigrated later. So we've got Poland is taking up a lot of the area that was Austria-Hungary or Germany. Uh, there's East Prussia. There's, um, you know, 
Czechoslovakia, Hungary, there's the Soviet Union, we also have Lithuania, um, Latvia, Estonia, places like that. The city names, like I said before, also change with political boundary changes. So uh, one quote, again, from Gary Makatov at Avatanyu um, said that some people are living today who were born in Lemberg, Austria, Bar, Mit Bar Mitzvah in Laval, Poland, spelled L-W-O-W, -W, married in Laval, Soviet Union, L-V-O-V, reside today in Lviv, Ukraine, L-V-I-V, but who have never left their hometown. The names Lemberg, Val, with the different spellings, have been used for the same city in Western Ukraine during the past 85 years. So, um, and of course, this is what Europe kind of looks like today. Um, so, um, so we have um, Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania is back, but there's new places like Belarus, um, Ukraine, Moldova, Slovakia, Hungary, Poland is back, um, Czech Republic, Serbia, Croatia, et cetera, other places that the names have changed. Uh, this is actually from the Holocaust Encyclopedia. I looked up Vilna and um, it tells you a little bit about Vilna in the Holocaust. And there are, you know, obviously can look up other places. Um, and it gives you an idea of what that part of the world looked like after um, the German Soviet Pact, 1839, 1940 and probably will also tell you what it looked like that area after World War II also. And I looked up Vilna in um, the um, Wikipedia and got some information about what it is today. And it is in Lithuania um, now. So you can get an idea of where that place is if you wanted to go visit or something, or you need to try to get records from that town or, or uh, for your ancestors. Uh, this is what Heritage Quest looks like through the library. And you need to put in your library card number and PIN. And like, it looks a lot like um, um, Ancestry or Ancestry Library Edition, but it's a little more specific to things like government records, like um, immigration, census records and things like that. Not, not a lot of those private records that maybe came from the LDS church, like church records or um, <laughs> family information, family specific information. All right, and I've mentioned this a few times, but familysearch.org is um, the LDS or Mormon churches genealogy websites and um, you can search their collection of scanned original documents, family trees, and their family history library catalog. They have um, the largest genealogy library in the world, and they have scanned most of what they own, 90% probably, um, is scanned and available for you to look at at their website. Uh, if you can't look at it on the website, um, you probably can uh, see it, find it in the catalog, and maybe you can, um, they used to do sort of an interlibrary loan of their stuff, but now they're, they're urging you to say, will you please digitize this particular book you haven't got to? And, um, and they do, that'll be like, it'll move up to the, maybe one of the next things that gets digitized if, if you're interested in, in it and hasn't been done yet. Uh, this is what familysearch.org looks like. You have to sign in to create an account, it's free, um, but you just have to choose a user ID and password basically to sign in. And then you can start searching. Um, I looked for Morris Woodlansky and um, I found some, some similar information to what we found before. 
we found the find a grave, we found the 1900-1910 census. There's also the New Jersey State Census, which I, I think I found on Ancestry too, but I didn't show it to you. Um, and there's some family information down below there too. They already have a family tree made for Morris and Rachel, although they didn't find quite as much as I did. Um, this is probably somebody else has, has entered some of this information. And, um, you know, when I was doing some searching, I found a little bit more, but we have Morris and Rachel and some of their, um, Isidore, by the way, I believe is Dory, no, no, Derry with Lansky is the one that's Dory or Dora or Derry. Isidore is a male. <laughs> and, <laughs> but there is a, is a son. Okay. Um, if, you also want to search for immigration and naturalization records because we did find some various dates about when the, this family immigrated. Um, you can find this information on Ancestry Library. You can go to that Ellis Island or Castle Gardens website if it's New York Immigration, the Immigrant Ship Transcribers Guild, um, or the US Citizenship and Immigration Service. But I kind of mentioned those before. Let's go back. Um, just I wanted to, to make a little mention about the immigrant uh, experience. Up until about 1870, the uh, sailing ships took two to three months or more to get to America. And so it was, it was kind of more of a, a huge commitment to immigrate to America. After the 1870s is when immigration of, from everywhere in the United States, uh, everywhere in the world picked up to the United States because we had steamships. And steamships cut the two to three months to two to three weeks. Um, and even later, the steamships became faster and, and was cut to like a week to get to the United States, to, um, to Europe, to the United States. Many did travel through the port of New York, but you could also enter in any other um, port. And some did come through Canada. It was usually a little bit cheaper to go through Canada. Um, so, it, you know, if you were short on cast, they might choose to come through Canada and maybe eventually immigrate to the United States. If you were going to immigrate, you uh, brought everything you needed for the rest of your life, basically, and you brought enough food for the journey. So usually the uh, ship is not feeding you. Um, so you, you need, need to bring food for your family for the, the two to three weeks or two to three months, depending on how long it was going to take. You'd have to bring your own bedding. Uh, you'd you'd uh, usually be on a bunk and maybe the whole family was on one bunk or two bunks. Um, and third class is how most people immigrated. Um, and third class is also called steerage or between decks. Um, but that was the majority of immigrants to the United States did come through steerage, which were not, not deluxe accommodation at all. <laughs> um, so you would have it be in one big room with a whole lot of bunks in it and um, maybe two bathrooms, um, one with a bathtub that, that you could take turns with. Um, people could maybe get, get to bathe once or twice on your journey if you're lucky. Um, you can, uh, this is an, what Ancestry looks like. You can search just immigration information. I put in Woodlandskis for 1865 about, I didn't make it exact because they weren't, didn't seem to be sure, uh, from Vilna, Lithuania. I found 19 information with somebody named Widlansky that came from Vilna. Uh, we have a Moses, which very well could be Morris. Uh, very often you would maybe Americanize or Englishize your, um, your name. 
um, to, to fit in and Moses could have become Morris. Uh, it says Russian, he's 21, which is about the right age uh, at that time. I'm not sure this is him because I just don't have enough information to be sure. But this is, this is all the information you get. You get the person's name. Uh, actually, there's a whole bunch of Woodlanskis here and I'm not sure of these other people. So I'm kind of thinking this is not him because this looks like a family traveling together. Um, but they're coming from Russia, which at some point it was Russia, that area. And where the squiggly line is, is where they ask where they're traveling. They're all traveling in steerage, um, third class. And they're all going to the United States. I think the uh, other squiggly line is where you're going. You're going to the US. Uh, this was a different Moses Woodlansky. No, this is the same one. It's just, um, So we have, uh, like I said, suspect maybe the same family because they're all listed together or just a, a lot of people named Woodlansky. But I don't recognize any of those other names. So may or may not be him. Not always in English. Um, this uh, looks like German. Um, but it tells you the name of the ship where they were leaving, where they were going to. Um, if they had a stop in between, like this one stopped in um, Glasgow, Scotland, before it um, left Hamburg and to Glasgow and then to the US, to New York. Okay, this is a passenger list. There is a Simon, Woodlansky, Gazelle Woodlansky. So once again, just to, to show you what these look like. And it does say here where they came from. And the Woodlanskys came, came from Vilna and they went to Philadelphia. If you look kind of in the middle bottom. Um, but, but that sort of makes sense because it didn't, I said before that it, their first two children were born in Pennsylvania and they may have immigrated through Philadelphia. So that could be him. Um, this is back to Jewish Gen. I just wanted to point out that you can search if you have a name of an ancestral town, um, you can search there, there's a uh, discover your ancestral town, uh, explore what life was like for your ancestors, um, connect to the Jewish Gen discussion group, search tens of millions of Jewish records. All this is great, great stuff that you can search at Jewish Gen. There is a Jewish Gen family finder too. So other stuff, there's a Jewish Gen Holocaust collection. This is the Jewish Gen unified search. You can search for the surname or it's phonetically like this surname and anything that's going to sound the same is, you know, fine to search. Spelling doesn't count. Uh, this is the, the Jewish Gen family finder. Uh, ancestral towns and surnames uh, can be searched here. This is the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum, which has some databases that you can search. They also have research services they will help you with. Um, you can find out um, what happened to an individual person during the Holocaust. You can look at database of survivors' names, register a survivor if you know of a survivor that maybe is not already registered. Um, the International Tracing Service, digital archives, so there's a lot of information here. Uh, this is Yad Vashem in Jerusalem. They have a central database of Shoah victims' names, photo archives, other resources here. Um, another one that I might would recommend 
that would be good to look at and maybe either uh, log in as a, um, just have a, a, or have a membership too, either log in as a guest or have a membership, is the Israel Genealogy Research Association. It says it's the largest genealogy society in Israel. So if you have um, um, distant um, relatives that may be immigrated to Israel, uh, this would be helpful. And it is, there's a lot of information about immigration. And I noticed when I was looking, researching this class, because this is actually from September 12th, 2021, um, that, well, that hasn't happened, has it? Yeah, sorry. <laughs> um, but there must be something happening. But this was just a few days ago that maybe I, I looked at this. Um, the Israel Genealogy Research Association has just released new and updated databases on its website. There are now over 2 million records available in their databases. Uh, it says before viewing and searching the database, please register for free at their website, at the IGRA website. It's genealogy.org.il, genealogy.org.il. The IL stands for Israel. Uh, and it says that the IGRA database are now searchable to all registrants. The search results page is also available to all registrants. Uh, additional details regarding most databases are available only to paid IGRA members. So basically you can search, you can get some information for free, but there, are, there may be some information that, that you need to be a member and it's $45 a year to join, so. Okay, other places to check, whoa. Um, the Social Security Death Index um, is, we mentioned this a little bit, uh, but if you have uh, ancestors that uh, maybe passed away more recently, like I'd say any time from the 1950s to now, um, you may be able to find them in the Social Security Death Index and find out when they died, where they lived when they died and things like that. Probate records or wills um, will give you a lot of information about a family, land records, synagogue records, local information, newspapers, obituaries and newspaper articles, federal and local tax records, military records, city directories, local histories, et cetera. Um, this is the Social Security Death Index for Samuel Widlansky, this is for their son. Um, uh, Social Security didn't start till 1935. Um, Morris died in 1934. Uh, his wife died in the mid forties or something. She probably is not findable on the Social Security Death Index either. Samuel though their son is because he died in 1990. But you'll see that he lived in New Jersey in fact, Atlantic City, New Jersey, or Atlantic, New, York, New Jersey. Um, he was died when he was 98 years old. His birthday, 10th of May, 1892, and his death date, 9th of February, 1990, is there. And there's also similar historical records that uh, Family Search thinks probably belongs to the same person, uh, like find a grave, World War I draft registration cards, things like that. Um, I put this up because this is the Mount Sinai uh, Synagogue in Cheyenne. And um, I said, we look at synagogue records. Um, Mount Sinai has a um, nice library. And in their library, they have genealogy of Cheyenne Jewish Cemetery. Also Mount Sinai Congregation History. So they have basically have some information that you can, if you had, uh, family members that went to a certain synagogue, you can find some, maybe some information about them there. And by the way, this um, Mount, si um, Mount Sinai Jewish Cemetery is part of the city of Cheyenne Cemetery Complex. And the burial listings are on the, the city of Cheyenne website. In fact, it's at, down at the bottom there. Mount Sinai Jewish Cemetery, 
you can see the most recent file of all burial listings in that cemetery. Um, I always want to mention DNA genealogy because it can be really, really helpful. Sorry, I'm, I'm already out, out to 4.30, but I'll keep going until we're almost done. Um, DNA genealogy can be a very, very effective tool, but won't give you all the ancestors, answers to your um, questions about your ancestors. It's best to use this in conjunction with traditional genealogy research and a, as a way to find those distant cousins that can be research partners or help you with your genealogy and things like that. Remember those ethnicity percentages you get are just estimates. Um, Jewish genealogy is further complicated by endogamy, which just means that um, your ancestors married within repeatedly within the same group. So they were probably um, great grandma was actually great grandpa's second cousin or first cousin. And that would happen repeatedly because you're living in a small town with a limited amount of, of Jews in that small town. And so everybody was relate, already related to each other that, that intermarried. And that just makes it look like you're probably closer related to your fourth or fifth cousins than you really, really are when you do the paperwork. Um, this is a little quote from Jewish Gen that I found. Uh, genetic genealogy is still most effectively employed in conjunction with traditional research for genetic similarities can often lead to confusing and or misleading results. This is particularly acute challenge when taking into consideration the fact that Jews traditionally marry other Jews, thus creating multiple family connections between individuals and thousands of possible matches when performing DNA testing. We therefore encourage Jewish gen users who wish to employ genetic genealogy to do so in conjunction with traditional research. Sorry, just that's just what I just said. This is my um, ancestry DNA results. And just to show you kind of what you will get, you will get your ethnicity estimates, you'll get a, a list of DNA matches. I have more than a thousand fourth cousins or closer. Often um, your um, matches for because of endogamy will be fourth or fifth cousins. And you may not ever find a, a relationship to that particular person, but people that are closer than fourth cousins are probably, honest to God, <laughs> really closely related to you, really are your third or second cousins and things like that. The through lines are really cool because if you put in a family tree, it will tell you the people in your family tree, who are the DNA matches through that particular person. So I could pick a, a great grandparent um, and who are the people that are my DNA matches that are also descended from that particular person or persons. Often it's a couple, of course. Um, and um, so that's uh, uh, the three through lines. It can basically help you figure out how you're related to that person and, and maybe if it's, if it's might be worthwhile to you to contact them. This is what uh, typical Ashkenazi uh, DNA results might look like. And this is, um, uh, uh, ancestry DNA, and this person, they have European Jewish as 99% and Eastern Europe and Russia as 1%. So it gives her sort of an area of the world where they think that her ancestors are probably from. And um, with the darker color, darker green color being more likely. Um, because they're kind of overlapping. Um, so you usually this kind of information is not real helpful because it's like, yeah, I know, I already knew they were from Russia or Eastern Europe. And, um, and that's all it's telling you here. Um, I'm looking over my notes here. Is there anything I didn't? Uh, here is a quote from someone that says, 
So I have double third cousins. Oh, okay. Wait, wait. Cousin marriages, uncle niece marriages, and other close family marriages abound in our trees, in Jewish genealogy trees. In my own family, on my Jewish line, my great grandmother fixed up her sister with her husband's brother to get that dowry for the family business. So I have double third cousins. Um, uh, it means that those shared matches feature at Ancestry is useless to us because it does not show how the two matches are related to each other and that can be quite distant. Okay. It says, in my experience, actual close relatives will always share large chunks of DNA. Um, so don't look at the ones that have, have only smaller chunks of DNA because it's probably because of endogamy. Um, this is what uh, 23 Me looks like. And again, I have a um, ethnicity percentages, um, but they also tell you a little bit more about your health and, um, and also give you a DNA relatives list too. But it, the thing with uh, 23andMe is their health reports. Okay, this is my last slide. Um, if you need more help, visit the Laramie County Library Special Collections Department on the third floor uh, or another genealogy place near you, um, uh, genealogy library. We are open Monday through Thursday, 10 a.m. to 9 p.m. and Friday and Saturday, 10 a.m. to 6 p.m. Sunday, 1 p.m. to 5 p.m. If you, you can email me uh, to get those handouts or to ask a question or things like that. Um, my email is e-h-a-y-e-s at lclsonline.org. You also, if you're having some problem, might uh, consider hiring a professional genealogist. Uh, I would try the Association of Professional Genealogists. It's at www.apgen, apgen.org. So apgen.org. Dot org for the Association of Professional Genealogists. All right, I am done. Um, uh, please let me know if there's anything that I could do to help you. Thank you. Have a good day. Bye-bye.